afternoon. My name is Steve King. I represent the 4th Congressional District of the State of Iowa. And um, we are here with, for this conference on the future of Middle East stability and a look at U.S. and Egyptian relations. This is um, this foreign policy issue is something that's been, of course, brought to my attention. I paid a significant attention to it for most of my adult life, maybe even all of it. But um, in my time here in Congress, as I, I watch as policy moved, and I see as our as our presidents who are in charge of, you know, of establishing and conducting our foreign policy, I thought that the Obama administration got a lot of things wrong. And sometime four or more years ago, and I thought it was very acute, maybe uh, further back than that, and I began to see it actually at the beginnings of the Arab Spring. I had some confidence that the skill sets that were in the State Department at the time were some of the best that had walked in there. And uh, yet, as I watched the Arab Spring unfold, I could see that one time after time, the United States foreign policy with regard to the Middle East was on the wrong side of every power change, every leadership change that took place in every nation state around the Middle East. And not only were they wrong every time, they fomented some of those problems that came out of them, the, the action that came out of them being wrong, and particularly in Egypt, where there were three changes in Egypt, and they were wrong every time. Now, you can toss a coin and come up with half the time, but when you've got all the resources and ability and the diplomatic skill sets in the world, uh, the strongest in the world here, and to get it wrong three times in a row, uh, I concluded that they were on the wrong side of the ideological spectrum, and they were actually following their ideology. That's why they were so consistently wrong. And if people wonder about how I might support such a statement, I would point out that President Obama, uh, he, made a, he made a point that, first of his middle name mattered to the Middle Eastern part of the world, and then he went, then he went to Cairo to say so. And that speech was on June 4, 2009. Curious things about that. Uh, were that he seated the Muslim Brotherhood in the front row. And that sent a message to the rest of the world that he was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And shortly after that, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton came out with a statement that said, Mubarak needs to be gone yesterday. Um, those signals, plus other State Department moves, um, were a contributing factor then to Mubarak essentially being pushed out uh, by the demonstrations that were in the streets and we saw the, I will say that there was a, at least back channel support for Morsi, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood that emerged. And I think it's more overt than that, but I don't know that I can cite those components from memory. So I would say that it was uh, at least back channel. But in any case, there was a change and Morsi won an election with, I think I've got it right, about 4.6 million votes, uh, something like that out of a population of around 83 million Egyptians. And that didn't last very long because he botched the he botched the the leadership of Egypt so badly, and uh, you can see, and it was clear to Egyptians that Morsi was consolidating power in his hand. And when he did that, the voice of the Egyptian people that had gone to the streets to essentially uh, re reject Mubarak um, began to realize that they weren't going to be in control of the country that they thought they were because they went to the polls and had an election, they thought they would be represented. And so um, I, th I, think of, uh, I think of movement after movement that was fomenting in Egypt, but on uh, June 29th, I believe, was the first day at the Egyptian site, June 30th. It might be because I'm watching the news here in Egypt, Egypt's seven hours or so ahead of us. But in any case, um, the, the movement of the Egyptian people with 33 million Egyptians coming to the streets out of a population of 83 million. That's the equivalent of roughly of 125 million Americans. Imagine what it would be like if we had 125 million Americans that poured to the streets of this city. If we have a million in the streets of the city, that's something that moves policy a little bit here. And uh, 125 million would put the brakes on and there would be a change. Well, 33 million Egyptians put the brakes on the Morsi regime and they pleaded uh, with, uh, with uh, now President El Sisi to take charge and take over control of the government. That happened with, I think, given the magnitude and the abruptness of the transformative, transformative change, it was relatively uh, low on violence for that kind of a transformation. And 
that uh, June 30th revolution that, that we cite, I went to Egypt in the first week of September. And there I met with, uh, well then he would be General El Sisi, the uh, Minister of Defense, uh, who had, who had uh, he, was, he controlled the military uh, at the time. I met with the interim president. I met with uh, Mr. Musa, who was the chairman of the Constitution Committee, and the Pope of the Coptic Church and others. I learned a lot in that period of time. I looked into the eyes of the people who would be formulating, in the process of formulating the new government in Egypt. And I remember the discussion with Mr. Musa and the discussions particularly with, um, with um, then General El Sisi about what the future of Egypt would be. The promises that emerged would be that they would write a constitution. And that constitution would be something reflective of the will and wishes of the Egyptian people that reflected some of, and I can't say all of, the values that we have in our constitution here. And, and uh, that they would put the constitution up for a vote and for a referendum to ratify the constitution, that they would be expected to, in that constitution, but also be expected to elect a president and a parliament. And those were the commitments that I received there in September 2013 and uh, in the subsequent meeting that I had when I went back to Egypt. I don't have these dates all down, uh, but it's five trips all together. But one of those was uh, the time that I had fulfilled my commitment to now President Sisi, which was if you follow through on these promises, then I will fly back to Egypt and I will come in and I will shake your hand and say thank you and congratulate you. I have done that. And I believe that Egypt has come a long ways um, towards fulfilling those promises. In fact, those promises, as stated, are fulfilled at this date. I want to commend the, the Egyptian government, with a, certainly led by President Sisi, and their rebuilding of the Christian churches in Rabat. And I will commend also the Coptic Pope for his position, which is, if they destroy our churches, we'll pray in the mosques. If they destroy our, the mosques, we'll pray in the street together. We'll pray for our enemies. Um, that's a powerful thing uh, that, that comes out of the religious community. I also commend uh, President Sisi for his speech at Al Azhar University, far different than Barack Obama's. Um, his speech um, contained within it some rhetorical questions. The most powerful of all in my memory was when he said, is it possible to accept the idea that the whole world must die so that Muslims can live. Of course not. And but he challenged and he challenged the essentially the Muslim world to that question. And we know that he is a committed Muslim, a modern committed Muslim, and I respect and admire him and I believe not only is he an honest man, he's a noble man with the best interests in Egypt in mind. And when I see the parliament that's been elected, the representation that's there, the women that are in parliament, the youth that are in parliament, the reflections of the various religions in Egypt that are there. When I hear President Sisi say to me that, that uh, he wants Egyptians to see themselves as Egyptians first and not be asking the question about what the religious affiliation is, just see themselves as Egyptians. If we could see ourselves as Americans always first, we'd always be better off here also. Uh, but we have together now, we have a mission, we have a challenge. And that's, that's to defeat radical Islamic terrorism wherever it is. And Egypt has been fighting it internally and on all sides, including the Sinai up against the Israeli border, where um, President Sisi has told me that his relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israelis at the time that Barack Obama was president was stronger than it was uh, with Barack Obama and the United States. Now, in this week, as we sit here, we've had some leaders in the Middle East arrive, and we've had state-level meetings. Uh, one of them, of course, is President Sisi's meeting with President Trump. That's the second meeting that they've had in the last uh, seven or eight months or so. It was last September when President Sisi came into the United States, and there was a clandestine meeting. I would call it that. It wasn't a public meeting with now President Trump, and it went very well. And President Trump said, I will roll out the red carpet for you. Uh, when I'm elected president and bring you into the United States and honor you as a state leader. And I want to go to Egypt and you take me and show me the pyramids. I'm a builder, show me how to build them. And so that was how their relationship began and their first meeting. Now I trust that it also went very well this week 
And uh, I see that, um, that Brett, uh, that King Abdullah is here from Jordan as well uh, as we speak. And I'm very encouraged by seeing these relationships because the, the central key to putting together the strategy to defeat the caliphates, wherever they are, and radical Islamic terrorism, wherever it is, is to have the alliances with the moderate countries in the Middle East and the United States. And, and I'm very happy that these meetings have been engineered and designed, and hopefully I've contributed to it in a, in a number of ways. I've laid out a strategy about how to defeat the ideology of radical Islamic terrorism, and I'll, there I'm going to let others speak more in more detail to the strategy. They have their own. I think it conforms to a degree we're going to find out here. I'm going to listen as well, but I'll just go through the points. We have to defeat an ideology, and some will say, you can't defeat an ideology. Ideologies are too entrenched. They just can't be defeated. I would argue instead that the United States has significant experience in defeating ideologies. What about the defeat of Nazism? What about the defeat of Japanese imperialism? What about the defeat of um, Marxism with regard to the Soviet Union and the implosion of, of that Marxist regime that was there up until the wall came down November 9th of 1989? Uh, ideologies can be defeated. It took three and a half years for two of them. It took 45 years for the other one. Well, so that should be an example to us that there isn't any standard cookie cutter approach. Each ideology and each circumstance needs to have a unique, unique program brought and levied against it. But I will just make these points. We need to do cyber warfare to shut down their communications capability. We need to do financial warfare to shut down their financial capability wherever the finances originate, transfer through, or the destination of we need to cut those funds off. Third one is education. We've got to slow down and stop, and it's the hardest one, the transfer of hatred to the next generation. We can't do that. We can't defeat the ideology. We need to build strong, strong relationships with the moderate, especially the moderate Muslim countries in the Middle East, and Egypt is that center of gravity. And without Egypt being the, the center of this, we have to all go back and retool. It's so essential that the relationships between the United States and Egypt and the, those of us who are joined together and will join together in this battle against Islamic terrorism, um, that, that, that we be, be strong in that alliance. And then we need to expand our human intelligence uh, throughout the Middle East and around the world. So the fifth component of that is the kinetic action that's necessary. And when it's well informed, when it's well funded and financed and trained, and when we have weakened the enemy by shutting off their communications and their money and their education and built a strong, uh, uh, the strong alliances between the moderate countries in the Middle East, and we've committed to that cause, we can and, and will see the day, and I mean that within our lifetimes and within a relatively short period of time, that the ideology is defeated and suppressed, and that the will of the Egyptian people, that the American people's support, will be strengthened. And I know that I get the question, why do the Americans support the Muslim Brotherhood? I constantly answer, and I send a message to Egypt as often as I can. The American people have never supported the Muslim Brotherhood. They've always been our enemy. But we know what the origin is. We don't blame Egyptians for that. We want to tie together with the Egyptians and, and, and declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization as Egypt has done, and a number of other entities have done. I'm a co-sponsor of that resolution to do that, and I hope Congress does that. Uh, that's some of our missions that are ahead today. You're going to hear uh, you're going to hear more detailed and perhaps varied approaches to this. That's my outline, and I have the privilege now. He's at my mercy. I told him, but I actually have nothing but compliments to say about Ellie Gold, um, who is vice president of the London Center, and he is the driving and working force that brings us together here today. And uh, his, these things are constantly on his mind. He brings it to my attention often enough that I'm. Um, hopefully uh, staying up to speed. But, but Ellie has been on this topic for a long time, and uh, he's engineered uh, many of the, of the good meetings and the brain trusts that come together, and he's driving policy that affects, I think, um, it affects the way things are approached in Egypt and around the Middle East and around the world. So um, I introduce and welcome Vice President of the London Center, Ellie Gold. Ellie? Thank you, Congressman. Um, if I had, had I known that that was the introduction, I would have made sure that my parents were here. Um, so it's 